Dr. Ali, your opening statement. Uh, hopefully tonight we don't hear that scratchiness from last night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I begin again by praising our creator and fashioner. I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. I ask him to bless all of you here today. Uh, bless this uh, beautiful city of Chattanooga and bless all of your loved ones, uh, all of us. Uh, I, as we come to the final day of my uh, public performance here in your great city, uh, I want to remark on, uh, on the fact that everyone I have met here in Chattanooga has been so nice. People at restaurants, people at uh, stores, um, everyone, people at the hotel, and, and of course, uh, my good friend, Bassam. You're, you're all wonderful folks, and, and I really enjoyed being here uh, with you. So to the business at hand, uh, tonight is the Bible, a, a book of peace. In order to answer that question, I want to go back to the criteria that I established last night to show the connectivity between uh, what we're discussing last night and what we're discussing uh, tonight. So we, we don't do deal with each book in isolation, but we want to have common principles based on which we can evaluate both books. Otherwise, as I said last night, it's anyone's call. Uh, we don't like a certain thing, so we say we don't like it, and then we invent our own reasons why we don't like that thing. And the thing we like, we, we invent different reasons for why we like that thing. But can we come to common ground and, and have common criteria for the two books? This is what I tried to establish uh, yesterday. And you will recall that when I dealt with that topic, I said, is the Quran a book of peace? And I answered that by saying, I'm going to use four criteria. And the first criteria... I said was, how does the book present its heroes? And I showed that the Quran presents its heroes as peaceful individuals. Even the biblical heroes, according to uh, David, as you know, uh, he said that uh, Joshua and David are known for violence in the Old Testament. Well, uh, a lot of violence, tremendous violence, uh, genocide included in, in, in the case of Joshua. But when they are represented in the Quran, they're represented as peaceful individuals or those who are shown to be associated with some violence, uh, the, the total violence that is known from the Old Testament is not repeated in the Quran. So on the whole, the violence is either toned down or eliminated altogether in the Quranic presentation of these heroes. And that's very important, uh, I, I believe, as a criterion. Uh, the second uh, criterion I said is, does the book command uh, people to live in peace? And I, I've, I've said that there's a verse in the Quran that does that. David disputed that, but, but that's not our question tonight. Our question is, if this is a criterion that I used in uh, looking at the Quran, how will that criterion uh, be applied to the Bible, and how would the Bible fear in, in the face of that criterion? The third criterion, I said, is that, uh, the book should put together a legal system that would allow people to live in peace. We know that you cannot have uh, uh, peace without justice. So do you have a legal system in the book uh, that allows people to uh, know their rights and responsibilities so that everything is fair and square between individuals so that people live in peace with justice? And uh, the third is uh, the just war theory that allows for, in the case that war becomes necessary, how do you fight a war? First of all, what are the uh, stipulations before going into a war to be sure that this is a just war to get into? Second, when you're in the war, how do you conduct yourselves in a just uh, manner? And third, at the end of the war, how do you repatriate and make things right, making sure that there's not going to be another war popping up suddenly and that uh, you have achieved the goal for which you set out uh, uh, fighting a war in the first place because you don't go into war without proper goals and now you want to make sure that it's all done. So that's just war theory. And uh, I said last night that uh, in my estimation there's nothing in the Quran that actually goes outside of these parameters of just war theory. And uh, my uh, challenge to David was to find something in the Quran and uh, show that this goes outside of just war uh, theory. And he did mention something, but I don't want to uh, relive that at the moment. If he wants to bring that up again, we'll deal with it, or if we have time, we'll deal with that uh, as a separate issue. Uh, but our main topic tonight is what we come to now. Applying these principles, uh, how do we evaluate the Bible. Now, to elaborate on my just war theory, I uh, drew on a book by Professor Darrell Cole from Drury University. H his book is entitled, as you can see, oh, uh, why is it that my um, presentation is not up? 
Uh, hold on. Um, it should be HDMI, which is there, and laptop, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? Because I didn't start it, actually. I just, here. Okay. So uh, to go back over very briefly, I started out with this slide, and then I, I moved on. I said, okay, these are my points, but uh, it, you, you've heard me, and there's nothing more to it than, than what you've heard. But I want to show you this book, and this is where, where we are. So Professor Darrell Cole has written this book. He's a professor at Drury University. He's a committed Christian, and he has given us the just war principles that comes out of the thinking of some great Christian philosophers uh, and saints, starting with St. Ambrose, and we went to St. Augustine and uh, Thomas Aquinas. I said these are the three A's, if you remember. And then he went to also John Calvin. So he said that's the C, so we have three A's and a, and a C for a good report card. Uh, but then it didn't end there. Uh, the, the thinking about just war theory continued into, in the Middle Ages and late Middle Ages into modern times. And uh, the uh, update on that is given by Professor Andrew uh, Wilson uh, in his course book uh, uh, that is uh, entitled The Masters, uh, Masters of War History's uh, Greatest uh, uh, strategic thinkers. And uh, so with this idea of just war theory then, we want to see how does the Bible measure up to, to that. Uh, if there is a war, how is the war conducted? So that brings us to the question of tonight, after having concluded myself that the Quran is a book of peace, I want to ask the same question about the Bible. Is the Bible a book of peace? So to evaluate that question, rather than put my own bias into the question, uh, let's go and, and use the same criteria, which I think to be fair criteria. Since I've applied that to the Quran, let's do that in the case of the Bible now. So the first cr criterion I want to look at, how does the Bible present it presents its heroes? Uh, David has given us uh, a rosy picture of the Bible talking about love, and, and that's true. And of course, uh, Christians are loving people. And in fact, uh, do you know that the Quran itself acknowledges that Christians are, are people characterized by love? In the 57th chapter of the Quran, the Quran says, uh, And we have placed in the hearts of those who follow Jesus uh, mercy and uh, compassion. Ra'fa. Uh, 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 could be uh, love and, and mercy and also compassion, the next word that is there in, in Arabic. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bassam, or those of you who know Arabic here. Uh, so the Quran is acknowledging that Christians are great people. Uh, they, they are loving individuals. They're characterized by kindness and all of that. So all of the history that uh, David has charted from the first century going to the later centuries of Christians setting up hospitals and, and so on, uh, feeding people, taking care of the orphans, all of this is acknowledged. There's no dispute there. Uh, now, oh, how does the book itself measure up because it, it is possible that Christians are good people not because of the book itself or maybe because of some parts of the book. Maybe they follow some parts of the book and ignore some other parts. We know uh, in, in logic that there is the fallacy uh, of, that fallacies related to causation. Uh, so people instead of identifying uh, the, the whole host of causes, they identify just simply one cause. Um, so we need to find out the whole host of causes, like what caused pe Christian people uh, to be uh, as, as they are. So one cause is, yes, they have read passages in the Bible. For example, God is love, First John chapter 4, verse 8. Now, uh, when, when we ask, is that the only teaching in the Bible, the answer uh, may be different. Um, so what about the heroes? How are the heroes presented? Now, it's often said that, uh, you know, these people we're talking about, Joshua and David and so on, they're all from the Old Testament, right? So what about the New Testament? The New Testament supposedly presents a new picture. However, in the book of Hebrews, uh, a number of persons are given uh, as the great heroes who were so great that the world is not fit to, to bear them. And among these persons are David and and. Uh, and others who, according to the book of Hebrews, what characterizes them as being great? They were conquerors. They were conquerors. And I thought David had a problem with uh, Muhammad being a conqueror. Uh, and whether Muhammad was or not, that's a separate question. But uh, if David has a problem with Muhammad being a conqueror, then how does this New Testament uh, uh, praise some people who were conquerors? So we have to get the whole list. And we can go to Hebrews chapter 11 and, and see that whole list uh, uh, before us. So we, we want to go to Hebrews. I'm in Hebrews chapter 1, go for, going forward to chapter 11. Uh, 
It's most embarrassing when you're looking for something and you can't find it. You know, and you thought it's there. So in Hebrews chapter 11, starting with uh, verse number 12, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, uh, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by their faith conquered kingdoms and so on, until he goes to say that the, the, the earth was not uh, fit to, to, to carry these uh, persons. So, uh, I don't know that much about Gideon, um, and I don't know anything about Barak, except that it's the Barak in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> But what about Samson? I remarked last night that, that Samson uh, killed himself and a whole host of people in the arena. Now, uh, you might say these were bad people, but do Christians kill bad people? Uh, does the New Testament teach us to kill bad people? Well, it seems that in this part, uh, the, the New Testament is celebrating uh, the, the life and glory of a person who is known to be a mass killer. Uh, and, and I, I say this with hesitation. I mean, I, David is right. Uh, uh, Muslims have to respect the Bible. And it is true that the Quran says uh, that uh, the, the Torah has in it uh, revelation from God. And Muslims believe that. We're not denying that. Now, for the, for the Muslim, they, the, the trouble is that there would be revelation also in these uh, ancient books. But also, those revelations are mixed with other things that people have put in there. So the Muslim needs to distinguish between the, the two. Uh, another verse of the Quran, which David did mention, is uh, the second chapter of the Quran, the 79th uh, verse, which says, uh, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say it is from God in order to profit uh, thereby uh, but a little. Uh, so uh, from this passage, Muslims generally understand that previous scriptures were corrupted by human individuals. And you might be saying, okay, the Quran is saying that, that's, uh, that's a Muslim book, we don't have to worry about a Muslim book. But in fact, uh, the Bible also shows that uh, the Torah has been corrupted. Where? In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 8. Jeremiah, the prophet, is saying, how can you say we are wise and we have the Torah of the Lord, whereas the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it? Now, the translations in various uh, books may be different, but that's the basic idea. Jeremiah is saying that the Torah, as they have them at that time, uh, as they have it at that time, is, has been corrupted by the pens of the, of the scribes. So now, for a Muslim, uh, when we read the stories about David and so on, we're saying David was a great prophet of God. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. How could Muslims accept that, uh, that a man like this uh, committed some of the atrocities that are mentioned of him in the, in the Old Testament. So, so we don't think he did. Uh, one of the things that's, that's mentioned about David is that he wanted to marry Michal, the Sa Saul's daughter. And uh, Saul basically said to him, well, you want to marry Michal? Great, but you have to bring me 200 Philistine foreskins. Now, so the Israelites and the Philistines are always at loggerheads with each other, and Samson was uh, usually going out and killing some Philistines and coming back. Uh, you know, he's the hero of, of the Israelites. Now, David is the hero of, of the Israelites, so to get married, he has to bring 200 Philistine foreskins. Now, how do you get 200 Philistine foreskins? You have to sculpt the men, right? Sculpt. Uh, so, it, obviously, we'd have to kill them first and then sculpt them in the right place and then bring back the proof that he has killed them. Then he gets the girl. Uh, none of this is mentioned in, in, the, in the Quran. Uh, what about uh, Jephthah? Jephthah actually uh, killed his, his daughter uh, after having um, uh, vowed to, to do so. And then God apparently fulfilled uh, what he wanted, and so he had to carry out the, the vow. And uh, it is interesting that the Quran actually prevents people from killing their infants. Uh, uh, David was citing uh, a Christian scholar who uh, said that, uh, you know, killing infants is wrong. Um, so it would be nice to have a verse of the Bible which say, says killing infants is wrong. And there, and there is actually a verse as well uh, about sacrificing your children to the gods. Uh, but uh, the Quran itself uh, prohibits people from killing their, their infants because at the time when the Quran was revealed, uh, girls were being buried alive, we, we learned from uh, some of the early sources. Uh, so uh, we go on to David. I mentioned David. That is Samuel. Uh, Samuel was receiving revelations from God. And his revelations were, were telling Saul that he had to go out and kill some more because Saul was basically commanded to kill off the Amalekites. And, uh, and he didn't kill them all off. So he spared some and some animals. And Samuel's message to, 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 Samuel's message to Saul was, God spoke to me and told me 
Man, you've got to go out and kill some more. You've got to kill them all off. So why kill them all off? Where does this idea come from? In the Old Testament, there's this idea of harem, harem, which is related to the Arabic word haram. So there, there's a total ban put on a town, but it's not only on one town. There are, are many places. Uh, God said to, uh, to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. And uh, within that land that God is giving them, ev everything that breathes has to be eliminated. So uh, several people are named, the Hivites, the Jebusi Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Amorites. Uh, I can't even remember all of the names. Uh, the Canaanites and, and, and the Amalekites. Uh, so uh, Saul's problem was that he took pity on some of them. He didn't kill them all. Uh, now, in Deuteronomy, uh, the, one of the books of the Torah, uh, details what's to be done. You uh, get into this, uh, you get into the, if, if you're dealing with a place that God has given you as your possession, the Israelites are given possession of that place, then they kill everything that breathes. But if they go to another place where outside of the range of which God has given them to possess, that means apart from what God has given them, they may have other conquering amb ambitions. If they go to this other place, then they should offer terms of peace. And if the people surrender under terms of peace, there is a way of dealing with them. Uh, but in the land in which God has given you, you, you kill everything that, that breathes. And so Saul uh, did not fulfill the commandments, and uh, that was uh, the, the problem there. So uh, the New Testament is approving of, the, of these great heroes. Uh, so, so that's my question. How does the book present its uh, heroes? That's my first criterion. The second cr criterion is, is there a command in the Bible that says you should live in peace? And... Uh, uh, I, I'm sure there is. I haven't studied it in, in that great detail, and I'm sure that uh, David will have verses lined up that deal with that. Uh, there are many parts of the Bible that actually are very peaceful, and when we acknowledge that. So I'm going to move on from that criteria, and I, I will say put a star there. The Bible uh, it has flying colors right there. Uh, three, what about a legal system? About a legal system uh, to le let people live in peace. Now, we've already seen that the Old Testament actually does not have a universal legal system that will allow everybody to live in peace. In fact, sometimes people, uh, like David will say, oh, but now we have the New Testament, everybody can love each other, and so on. What about the people in Palestine? That, the people in Palestine live in part of the land which the Israelites think has been given to them. They have the title deed. But is the title deed a book from God. So this book says that they own all of that land, and the Palestinians do not have a right to live there. So Jews are coming in from other parts of the world, flocking into Jerusalem because they think that they should be there, and the Palestinians are being shoved off uh, of of the, the more lucrative parts of, of the land. So even uh, international de uh, decrees are defied by those who think we don't have to follow the international decrees. We can go set up our residence on the Palestinian land because it's not really Palestinian land. This land is our land, God told us. So these commandments in the Bible actually do have repercussions for peace in our present times. It is not a, a, a complete system of justice that will allow people to live in peace. Now, does the New Testament change that? No, actually no, because the New Testament uh, af reaffirms the right of the Israelites. Uh, the, the New Testament basically says, well, Christians are the new Israel, uh, but there is ambiguity in the, in the New Testament with uh, Paul, for example, saying that God's promise is irrevocable. So you give a promise to the Israelites, that promise is irrevocable. Uh, so... The Israelites do own that land according to the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. Today, there is a pro proposal that perhaps there can be pe a peaceful settlement between Palestinians and, and Israelites. Let's uh, have a two-state solution and divide uh, uh, Jerusalem. We take e East Jerusalem, you take West Jerusalem. Some say no. Why? Because God gave them Jerusalem. And the New Testament affirms that, that Jerusalem uh, is... is uh, has that status, even all the way down to the book of Revelation, which uh, I like um, uh, David's statement, the marching orders. What, how does the book end? The book ends with uh, Revelation reaffirming all of these things. Now, the just war theory. Does the, the book give you a just war theory? And in fact, uh, no, we, we cannot approve of genocide. No just war theory is going to ap approve of genocide and ethnic cleansing. And yet we see that being done in the Bible again and again over and over. Finally, I want to say something about the book of Revelation because it's all this about, uh, you know, God is love and so on. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It sounds nice. But then the book of Revelation shows that when Jesus comes back, he will actually kill off the people 
who were his enemies. So he will persecute his enemies rather than pray for them. Moreover, there are indications in the uh, book of Revelation that his faithful followers will be caught up into heaven with him uh, in the great rapture, and then they will come back with him to fight in his great army to do what? To decimate the population. And it is interesting in the, that in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 63, God is shown with his clothes bloodied after he has, like, stepped over the dead bodies of his, uh, of his enemies. And now Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is shown like father, like son. He comes back with a sword coming out of his mouth. He kills his enemies. His uh, uh, garment is also uh, red with the blood of his enemies. And when we debated a, a few weeks, uh, a week or so ago in uh, Detroit, David quoted for me a, a passage from the Psalm, Psalm 110, showing that uh, God is saying to Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is going to be sitting on a throne, and what is his foot going to re rest on? The slain bodies of his enemies. And uh, in, there is the undercurrent in the New Testament thinking that Jesus should be that victorious conqueror. So we have both. It is both a book of love and also a book of war and dreadful violence. Thank you.